grace and mercy and peace to you from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you something this morning. I'm going to start off by asking a question. How many of you knew, or did you know, that you are here today because of a moon-worshipping pagan? Now that I've got your attention, now, <laughs> now let's go to the Old Testament reading. We're looking at the Old Testament reading, Call of Abram. That call occurred roughly around the year 2000 B.C., so 2,000 years before Christ. Abram was the ninth generation descendant of Shem, the son of Noah. So you had Noah and his sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Abraham comes from Shem's line, nine generations. What's kind of sad is that when you read the scriptures, Shem was still alive when Abraham or Abram was alive. Even to the point where Shem was still alive when Abram was over 100 years old. Here's the thing. Here's what's kind of sad. Abram's grandfather, nine times removed, but still, Abram's grandfather, the one who helped build the ark, the one who saw the world before and after the flood, the one who experienced the power of God firsthand, was still alive when his grandson, Abram, didn't even know who God was. God's word tells us that Abram grew up and lived in the land of the Ur of the Chaldeans until his father moved away from that area. Here's, here's your quiz this morning for world geography. Where Ur is there? Does anyone know what country that is today? Iran. That's Iraq. Ur is in modern day Iraq. You know what's really interesting to me? If you were here last Sunday, we talked about how that same area there is where the Garden of Eden was. It's interesting to me how the devil works because recent excavations show that Ur was one of the most ancient cities, if not the most ancient city in that region, and Ur of the Chaldeans was the center of Chaldean moon worship, along with God, other gods and goddess worships. So where the Garden of Eden once was, and where Abram grew up, is where they worshiped the moon, along with other pantheon of gods and goddesses. Joshua 24, 2 says this, Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, long ago your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, who were also forefathers, lived beyond the river, the Euphrates River, and worshipped other gods. Here's the point with this. Abram was not a follower of Yahweh when God called him to leave everything behind and go to the land that God had shown. In fact, there's no indication that Abram had ever heard of God before he came to him and instead worshipped the gods and goddesses of the Chaldeans. From one generation to the next, from Shem to Abram, the truth of the Lord died out so much so that Shem's grandson was worshiping other gods and goddesses and paying out to the Lord. There's a lesson here. What we know needs to not stay with us. And it is up to each generation to pass the message of Christ crucified and risen for the forgiveness of the sins to the next generation. It is up to the parents to teach the children. We should not, as a Christian church, a Christian church around the world, should not be surprised when we see young people leaving the church. We shouldn't, especially if the parents themselves do not come to church especially if the parents themselves are not teaching the children the truth of God's word. We should not be surprised. If mom and dad don't think it's important, why should I? Back to, that's just tangential. Back to April. Let me ask you something. You go home today after church. I'm sorry, you go home today after Bible study, because you're all coming to the adult Bible study. <laughs> you go home today after the Bible study. You sit down in your, in your easy chair. Kick your feet up. And a God that you have never heard of 
suddenly manifests and appears in your living room and tells you to leave everything and everyone <coughs> behind and promises that if you do, he'll make you rich. How do you respond? How many of us would respond? Most of us probably wouldn't. If anything, most of us would probably think we were hallucinating or having a breakdown of some sort. There's no indication that Abraham thought that. There's no indication that he hesitated. In fact, the indication it seems that he immediately responded and obeyed. Now, I don't know about any of you. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just Michael. But I am so glad that God does not ask us to trust him like he asked Abraham. I am so glad God doesn't require anything of us. I am so glad God does not ask any of us to move out of our comfort zones. I am so glad that God doesn't ask us to put our lives into his hands and to trust him and not rely on our own understanding. Oh, wait a minute. He does do those things, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he does. And again, one of the interesting things with the call of Abram, again, he didn't know who God was when God called him. God came to Abram in spite of who Abram was. God chose him. God chose him and Abram responded. He left behind false gods and worshipped the one and only true God. He believed in the Lord, in Yahweh, as the one and only God to the point where he was willing to sacrifice his own son Isaac a few years later just because God told him to. <coughs> How many of you would be willing to do that? be honest, if God came through with a directive like that regarding a lie, I'd probably ask for some ID, at least. I won't know that I'd be willing to do that. God chose Abram, <coughs> and through Abram, blessed all the nations of the world, because from Abram comes the line of Jesus. So back to my opening statement, we're here today because of a moon-worshipping pagan. A moon-worshipping pagan who turned away from the empty life that was that he was living and responded to God's call. Responded to God's call through the Holy Spirit, working in his heart to bring him to faith. The only part that Abram had in his call was not to say no to God. Jumping Testaments for a minute. John 15, 16. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and then by extension to you and me today. Disciples in the year 2014. And this is what Jesus said. You did not choose me, he said. I chose you. <coughs> like Abram, the only part we have in the call of Jesus on our lives, the only thing we have to do with the Holy Spirit bringing us to faith is not saying no. <coughs> Listen to what the Holy Spirit says in Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. Even before he made the world, this is a New Living Translation. I like this translation a bit, a bit for these, these verses. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So he praised God for the glorious grace he's poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. <coughs> he showered his kindness on us. Just think about that. Before the creation of the world, we were chosen. When God saved Shem in the flood, he was thinking about you. When God chose Abram, he was looking ahead to you and me. When Jesus was on the cross and experienced literal hell, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was all about us. And he was thinking about us. When he came out of the tomb, it was all about our sins being gone forever. And it gave him great pleasure to do it. One more time back to the calling of Abraham. There is a phrase with the calling of Abraham that's only used twice 
in all of Scripture. It's in the, in the original Hebrew. It's only used twice in all of Scripture. And it's only used in the life of Abraham. The first time it's used is with this call, when God came to him the first time. The second time it's used is when God came to Abraham to ask him to sacrifice Isaac. In Hebrew, it reads, Lech Lecha. And it literally means, get up and go and do it right now. That's what it means. When God came to Abram, what he said was, get up and go right now, Abram. Leave everything and everyone and go. And I will take care of you and I will bless you. Just go and do it right now. And Abram obeyed. Almost. He almost obeyed. Did you catch what verse 4 and 5 said? Let's look at verses 4 and 5 again. <coughs> so Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions he had accumulated, and all the people he had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Abram obeyed up to a point. He didn't leave. He did indeed leave, but he didn't leave everything behind like God told him to. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household. And go to the land that I will show you. He didn't leave behind his people. He took his nephew with him. He didn't leave behind his fully his father's household. He took all the servants and all the possessions with him. Uh, maybe we shouldn't be too hard on, on father or Abraham as the song goes. Maybe we shouldn't be too hard on him. I think we'd probably do the same thing, right? How many of us would do the same thing? I trust you, God. But up to a point, you want me to go out and make disciples of all nations? How about if I just bring a pie to the next pot? I'll make it a homemade one. I'll let somebody else go out and invite people to church. Let somebody else go tell them about you. Here's the hard one. Here's the one that people don't like to hear. Make your toes curl. You want me to tithe, God? You want me to trust you? How about if, after I pay all my bills, go out to dinner and a movie, spend some money on clothes, some other things I don't need but I want, then I'll see what's left over. And then what's <coughs> left over out of that, I'll give you a small portion of that. Maybe somebody else will make up for what I'm not doing. You want me to read your word and be engaged in it with my family? How about if instead I just listen to a few verses of your word read to me once a week? And hopefully when I ask my kids if they want to go to church, instead of telling them they are going to church because I'm the parent, they're the kid, and when I say goes, how about when I ask them if they want to go to church, maybe they'll say yes. And then maybe they'll hear something from somebody else that will help them in their faith walk. And you know what? You know what the answer God gives to all of this? The answer he gives is the same one he gave to Abram. Get up and go. Trust me. Give me yourself. Give me your everything. Watch what I'll do with it, he says. I will give you a new heart from Jeremiah. I will give you a future and a hope from Jeremiah. I will never leave you or forsake you from Matthew. I will always be by your side, Psalm 4. I will rejoice over you with singing, Zephaniah. Just like the God. Not because you have to, but because you trust me. Because you know there's a world people out there who don't know my son. Like the car, he says, in your home, with your family, at your work, in school. I am always with you. I will always love you. You are mine. Abram did not fully obey God. And it caught up with him. His nephew Lot ended up causing a very unpleasant split in the ranks. And Abram ended up going, and later on, going to war against an alliance of four kings. 
the lot of his family were captured. Following the Lord always brings blessings. Maybe not the way we think, or the blessings we'd want at that time, but in the end, those who follow are blessed. Those who follow but bring their own ideas, or I'll follow up to a point, or I'll follow but here's what I really think, are never as blessed as they could be. The relationship with their Lord is never what it could have been, and their lives are always more complicated than they need to be. To follow God, to be a disciple, means to surrender to Him. It's a lesson that Abram didn't learn, not at first anyway, not until after years and years, after a number of very close calls and a number of difficulties. After a number of times, he decided to take matters into his own hands. And that has to do with the consequences of his sin. The good news for you and me today. On the cross, Jesus again experienced hell. And he died for those sins, for Abraham's sins, for your sins, and for my sins. Now, you and I today, we're able to elect the car more than Abraham ever was. For those in Christ, our final destination is sure. And we understand that more than others. And we perhaps even understand more than others how temporary this life is. How fleeting it is. Just like the car, God says, let me show you the fantastic things I have planned for you. Follow me, Jesus says. I will make you fishers of men, and we will change the world. I love that line from the movie The Son of God. What are we going to do now, Jesus? Change the world. I love it. Trust me, the Holy Spirit says. I will give you a faith unlike anything you ever thought possible. Just like the car. Get up and go. Let's like the car. Let's go to our God in prayer. Will you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for choosing Abram, even when he didn't know you, and blessing us through him. Thank you for choosing us before the creation of the world. Jesus, thank you for being the sacrificial lamb in our place. Thank you that because of you, we have the sure and certain hope of everlasting life in heaven. Holy Spirit, thank you for the faith that you bring. Increase faith in us and help us to not say no to you. Triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, thank you. We praise and bless you today, tomorrow, now, and forever. Amen.